Today, I would like to talk about, um, I would say, a niche research field, which is uh, not well known, at least in computer vision, which is fragmented occlusion. So occlusion, of course, is a, is a very well, <clears throat> a very well known problem, I would say, and it's still a big challenge uh, in, in computer vision. But fragmented occlusion is kind of a class or a category of occlusions which are not well known, I have to say. And, and this is my topic at the moment, which I'm working on. Uh, I would like just to say that I'm uh, showing also you uh, pictures and videos which uh, were not part of my fellowship, which was uh, just before uh, in a new research project, which was uh, called Foldout where we were working on actually through foliage detection technologies in border surveillance and actually the whole idea of of kind of working on this problem uh, just uh, emerged in this in this research project so what is actually fragmented occlusion and, and just to give you I don't know why this weird yellow uh, actually line just appeared here, but I'm, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so it's not part of the slides. So uh, just to, to, to give you a problem formulation, what, what I actually understand on the fragmented occlusion, I just want to show you these two images. So basically fragmented occlusion occurs in natural environments. And this is very contrary, I would say to to man-made environments, uh, which are actually omnipresent in computer vision. When you just think about, you know, uh, the business cases, which are actually driving very much computer vision today, like for example, autonomous driving, uh, there you usually see in the benchmark data pictures from let's say cities or like, all kinds of man-made environments, where of course occlusion is a big topic, but not so much fragmented occlusion. <clears throat> and fragmented occlusion um, is caused by trees, uh, by leaves, you know, by all these kinds of things, um, by foliage in general. And you see on the left-hand side a picture of a person which is behind uh, bushes. Uh, I think this picture was taken in April, so there were not so many leaves. And on the right-hand side, you see actually two big trees and uh, what you would expect in a forest, I would say. And that picture was taken in this in this view research project where actually people were interested in, in, in surveillance in forests. And can we kind of, you know, detect suspicious people and things like this. And uh, uh, so what we did, and that was the starting point actually, what we did in this, in, this, in this project was actually trying to better understand, you know, how person detection, which is a, a subfield in computer vision, how person detectors actually perform in, in these environments, right? In these forests. And what you see here, uh, here so we, here are four, we, we have chosen four, I would say standard detectors at that time. And if you're interested, um, I, I, I gave you a pointer just uh, below, you see a, a paper uh, reference where you can read more about this. So we, we have chosen at that time, you know, four detectors, which is SSD, YOLO, FASTR RCNN, and MASK RCNN, which were standard detectors at that time. Is still kind of very popular nowadays, but uh, of course there are new kinds of uh, adaptions. But basically, uh, I would expect the same results. So they work all reasonable well uh, in this environment, although we just took them out, you know, of the GitHub box, I would say, and didn't change anything in terms of parameters, hyperparameters. We did not train them specially. Um, and, and, and this is actually what you have seen in this video, right? So we have got bounding boxes and, and, and that looks all really pretty well. And, and except maybe for SSD, there, there are a couple of uh, uh, false negatives actually. But okay, that was the, the exception. Now, 
okay, this is not, uh, this, is, this is okay, this is fine. There is a full visibility. But what happens now when we go really into this case of, of fragmented occlusion? So when it comes really to a through foliage detection, and then the picture looks a little bit different. So what you see here in these videos are kind of qualitative results of exactly the same detectors. And now you really see that uh, they have really big problems uh, with, with these occlusions and that, of course, there are detections from time to time, but in most of the cases, they are not able to really detect the objects, these people walking behind the trees. And so in a way, the, these methods all break down uh, due to this fragmented occlusion. And the reason is why there are detections from time to time that there is a kind of a sufficient visibility which allows the detector to extract those spatial features which are necessary for a kind of a detection, right? So just to summarize uh, from this field work we did in this Foldout project is that we, we kind of can say that all these kind of prominent approaches, which are really were a breakthrough, I would say, in, in, in object detection in the last years, uh, all built on neural networks, um, that they kind of uh, are very much limited, sorry, limited in overcoming fragmented occlusion as they consider, and this is our observation, the single image. So they're all based on the single image, and the single image is not able to allow you to cope with this fragmented occlusion. So what is the solution, uh, I would ask you? Well, a solution could be, you know, uh, of course, to kind of squeeze out all the information which is in the single image, but I would say uh, a more practical solution would be to generalize recognition from the single image actually to video. And this, this idea is not new, right? So I'm not the first person who's proposing that or other people, um, but that would be um, an interesting way to go. And there's a lot of evidence uh, that motion or motion perception is very fruitful for object recognition. At least, uh, from the, for example, from, from the human motion perception literature. Um, and so the, the, we know that the, the light forms patterns on our retina are changing with time. And, and, and there, there is a bunch of really interesting results in, in, in at least in human vision that uh, kind of human motion perception as a kind of unconscious inference is good. It's very good for a, for a, for a lot of lots of things actually. Very important things in visual perception. For example, for a recognizing 3D shape, that's 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 clear. That you, you cannot you cannot infer a 3D shape fully um, from a single image because of the projection process. Um, then, of course, the segmentation of camouflage, foreground from background. That's a really a tricky thing. I have a, um, a, nice, a nice video just in the next slide. Then the distance to various objects in the scene, you know, when you would like to compute something like time to collision. So their motion perception is really powerful tool. Or the direction which you're heading within the scene. Action recognition is basically based on motion perception or also detecting that something is moving, right? Um, these attentional mechanisms are very important uh, for us humans to, to focus our um, uh, thinking, right? Or visual um, um, processing tasks within the brain. And of course, one could think that this might also all, all be very important for computer vision, which indeed is, is true. Now, what causes, causes uh, motion in general? So I think there are two different kinds of events that ca can cause visual motion. Um, the one is that when an observer moves through an otherwise stationary environment, 
So the enteroretinal image changes over time. That's one cause. And the other, of course, is that the yeah, an object moves in the scene, right? And, uh, and the observer is stationary. So that only small regions, the retinal image are changing over time. And of course, there is a third case where, where both happens. And this is in the normal case, I would say, with human, right? Um, which is a tricky thing, actually, in computer vision. Um, and when it comes to motion analysis. Uh, I just would like to, well, this is a, a video where I can show you. I just actually wanted to skip that, but okay, when it's just present. Uh, this is just one, one video which nicely demonstrates that you cannot infer 3D shape from a single image. But when you have, you know, multiple images, that becomes possible. Uh, here is a video uh, of this former uh, slide I showed you of these trees. Um, and now I would, would like to ask you, you know, can you, can you in a way uh, recognize what's behind those trees, behind this foliage? Is there somebody actually can tell me what he can recognize or see? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that, that you will not kind of be able to recognize something. But now I'm showing you the video uh, and I think it should be possible now for you to recognize. So when you, when you now watch the video, then in a magical way, your brain is in a way inferring what's, what's behind this fragmented occlusion. So at least for me, it's possible. And I can see a human actually. I can even see long hair and, and I see in a way the body, the body shape. And I would expect that that might be a female. And, and I see a backpack actually even and, uh, and a sweater with kind of uh, white long strips. So there's really a lot of information in this sequence of images. Uh, which which just uh, got present to you uh, when you see really the whole sequence, not only a single image. Right? Here is another example. It is is uh, this camouflage example I just mentioned. So when I would ask you, you know, can you see the object within this single image, which is kind of in this case not occluded, it is fully visible. Uh, you will not tell me, uh, you will not be able to tell me actually, right? Um, uh, by the way, this is a, this is a thermal image uh, taken at a, at a, at a, at a forest uh, and Greenland uh, border. And it's uh, so bright because of the heat, because this grassland heated up during the daytime as, as the body of a person. <clears throat> And I'm just telling you, so the object is, seems to be a person. But when I show you the video, it is very simple for you. I think it's, it's easy to, to recognize uh, that there is a human walking on this uh, grassland. So the, this camouflage uh, problem has a lot of similarities with fragmented occlusion. So when you talk with an experimental psychologist, you would say it's actually the same problem because uh, as the human walks, uh, 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 the, the person reveals and also hides information in the background. So very, very similar to fragmented occlusion where you have all these little holes in between those leaves, uh, which, uh, which can give you uh, information in the sense when something is moving behind, uh, information might be revealed or might be hidden again. Now, when it comes to theories or to a better understanding of fragmented occlusion, I have to say that in the cognitive sciences, there is really a fundamental literature about it. I'm not an experimental psychologist. I'm also not a neuroscientist. But there, there are a couple of theories, you know, and they're trying to explain how we are able to recognize uh, objects under fragmented occlusion. 
So this goes really back to anorthoscopic perception, which was kind of born by Helmholtz uh, in end of the 19th century, I would say. And uh, there were a couple of concepts coming up in the 60s, like the concept of persistence, for example, uh, which can be seen, for example, in this, in this illustration on the left-hand side. So here, what you see here is, uh, there, there is a there is an object of interest which is this rock, and there is a occluder which moves, right? So in in, in this case, for example, the, the object of interest is not visible at all, right? But then there are these little slits, and so as the occluder moves, uh, some parts are revealed. So you see suddenly this uh, lower part of the rod, and then the upper part. And so the, the con and this is called also the Spillings experiment. So the, the idea here is that when something becomes visible, partially visible, we as humans we are able in a way to uh, keep that persistent, this part, right? Uh, Nicer also called that the visual icon. And then when other parts of the object become visible, we are able, in a way, to, to, to form connections, to draw correspondences between those parts, and then we are able to, to perceive the object, this rod, as a whole. This also uh, works when the rod is moving and, and the occluder is static, as I have shown you before with the, with the forest. So here the rod is moving from left to right, as you can see here. And some parts are revealed by these little slits. And then, and this is a second very important concept uh, in the way we humans are able, in a way, to positional update those little parts as they become occluded again. And that's, that's it's very important to be able then to draw kind of um, correspondences or, or contour completions called sometimes. Um, um, based on that, on that, all that kind of theories, um, there was a theory, I think it was a paper in 2006 coming up about, you know, uh, this theory of recognition under this called dynamic occlusion or fragmented occlusion, which is called spatial temporal relatability theory uh, by Palmer, Kalman, and Shipley. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea here, there are kind of three kind of concepts. So basically, uh, they are talking about a, a, a dynamic, dynamic visibility regions representation. You know that in a way, when something becomes visible, you know, you have to represent that. That might be a, a visual representation, but also more abstract representation of motion, for example. And then, and then, in a way, uh, a representation of these parts as they become occluded which is very much in correspondence to this idea of a visual icon, at least in the form of an abstract representation, because in a way you would have to update a velocity vector or something like a trajectory or kind of also projecting a trajectory to know where this part of the rod might be in, let's say in a millisecond or something like this. And then this spatial temporal contour interpolation, which is, uh, which is then the necessary process to, to, in a way, receive a whole image of something you would like to recognize, right? And I'm not, as, I, as I said, I'm not an expert, I'm not a psychologist explaining you these theories now in detail, but just to show you here uh, more like an illustration, like these, these little slits uh, might be interpreted in, in our case as those kind of, you know, little holes, which might be, for example, in this example, there is a tree, there, there, there is a fence and a seam where from left to right, as of from this image A, B, C, D, from left to right, there is a, it seems a car moving. And, and, and these little, these little slits, these little holes, you know, they, they give us information over time. And now, and now this theory tries to explain how, you know, those little parts which have become visible over time are in a way aggregated and then accumulated to a whole picture, you know. This is actually um, 
this is an idea, a theory, how, how human, humans are able actually to recognize objects in such situations, right? That you accumulate these fragments over time, and then this, you can, in a way, use this whole picture for recognition. And these this time intervals where this uh, um, uh, aggregation happens is, is very large, actually. So it's about 125 milliseconds. So it's in the milliseconds. And this is in neuroscience an age really it's it's really, really long so it sounds really short but this is really long time so this also indicates that that the spatial temporal integration processes are very important for recognition okay so this just uh, uh, kind of closes this part of human vision because i'm not expert in that but i found that quite interesting when it comes to computer vision, uh, there is really not much known, I have to say, you know, in for about fragmented occlusion. So um, there are a couple of papers from the 90s, I would say, which really mention fragmented occlusion in their papers. And there is a single paper by Michael Black and Peter Anadan from 1994, which is really kind of a little bit elaborating on it. So basically what you see here on the left-hand side, there is, uh, actually, I think this is Michael Black in young days. <laughs> staying behind his pl a plant in, in his room. And, and, and then the camera is actually moving and it just introduces two motions into this little video, right? So this is a single image, but this is a whole video, right? And so um, what these people were studying at that time was actually the problem of multiple motions in motion analysis. Um, but fragmented occlusion is a very good example which causes multiple motions, right? And what you see on the right-hand side is um, is an estimator of of the motion uh, based on that time, you know, uh, Horn and Schum constraint, which you can see here, you know, uh, where which you take to the square, and that formulates an error function which because this constraint should be zero, so that would mean you you, have, you kind of hit the, the correct uh, motion vector. Uh, so basically, when you try to minimize this in a region uh, of pixel, so pixel region, I would say, then you can be able to estimate uh, uh, the motion in 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 in, in that in that pixel, or in you 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 can estimate. Uh, even a parametric motion model given by P and Q, right? This is actually um, a more general um, error function. Uh, anyway, what, what is important is what you can see here is uh, there are a couple of lines here and they are all coming from these linear constraints, uh, which are given by, by these intensity values in the region. And they actually, they form two clusters, right? Uh, because there are two motions, there is the motion of the background and the plant, you know, this global motion, I would say, and there is this little motion, uh, which is actually not a motion because it's all static of the person, which is standing still. So there are these two motions, and when you uh, when you use uh, at, at that time, that was the interest of these people, right? When you use this uh, quadratic uh, uh, regression, this regression based on this uh, quadratic error function. Then you, you estimate something in the middle. This is this red plus, right? Which is basically not correct. Uh, and that was the critics in this paper. And so uh, they tried to improve that and they introduced, and that was very influ influential this paper. They introduced a robust function, right? Instead of taking this to the square, they introduced a, a some kind of robust function. And by, by using that robust function, and by using a dominant motion approach, that means you try to first estimate the dominant motion. And then when you have estimated dominant motion, you can, you can find all the outliers, the pixels, which are not corresponding with the motion. And then you apply that again, you can find multiple motions, right? That's what they have done. And they were in this way uh, able with this robust cost function to correctly estimate the first center uh, of these you know intersecting uh, constraint lines and then and this is in the next slide the second uh, motion 
And what you see on the left-hand side, so white pixels are the corresponding pixels, which are uh, which form this coherent region uh, uh, of the specific motion. So basically, that was basically the plant and the background, so the white pixels. And here, uh, that is the second motion, which is basically not a motion at all, uh, which is the person and the shade of the person, actually, because that's also a kind of stationary. So in a way, uh, that is the only paper which was actually elaborating on the problem of robustness, but they use fragmented occlusion as a, as a, as a case, actually, to, sh to show that you can do better. And and that's that's very interesting, but but that's the only actually mentioning of fragmented occlusion, and that's actually a, a solution to the problem, right? There are a couple of other papers that mention fragmented occlusion in the same way, but uh, but there is no literature in recent times actually which are elaborating on fragmented occlusion at all. Okay, so. Um, now, I would like to just stop with this introduction and to talk about fragmented occlusion and those kind of uh, theories. Uh, and I would just would like to show you um, a work we did uh, on, on a specific visual task, which was person localization under fragmented occlusion. So in this, in this work, which was a joint work together uh, with Jonas Auer, we were interested, and this is a sample image, what you see here, are we able to develop an uh, automatic algorithm which is able to at least localize or give us a, a pixel coordinate, right? Of a, let's say a center point or so uh, of the person as it is walking behind those trees. And uh, uh, so there, there, of course, there is now a kind of a first solution. And this was actually a master thesis together with Jonas. And if you're interested, you can find more information on his GitHub uh, a, a repository page. So uh, now I would like to uh, dig a little bit deeper into this work. So um, I think, uh, so we formulated the, the, uh, uh, the basis of the method, the methodology was based on, of course, on, on deep learning, which uh, is basically at the moment very trendy. And uh, so we choose uh, actually a very popular supervised learning framework for this task. And, 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 and also we did empirical evaluation. And, and, and as, as, as always with deep learning, so we generated hand labeled data for training and also for testing uh, and validation of this neural network. As model, as you see here, we have chosen a UNET. So basically, uh, that's all well known. Uh, UNET is a, is an encoded decoder generative uh, network uh, with skip connections, which is very suitable for domain transfer and image processing tasks. Um, now, what do, what is new in our work is basically that we we use the UNET uh, uh, not with single images, but with um, uh, but with, uh, with video frames where we uh, kind of exploited this multiple uh, channel structure uh, of the input, right? So basically we fed or we feed the, the unit with not only a single image, but with grayscale images where we use the, the, cha the channels actually um, to represent those, those sequence of images. Now this general generalizes in a way the unit as an unrolled recurrent network. I think we, uh, where spatial features in a way are generalized right, to spatial temporal features. Now, what would what kind of properties can we expect from such a generalized unit? Well, our hypothesis is that these composed spatial temporal features are able to carry the information uh, to recognize, you know, targets under fragmented occlusion, or in this case, persons. And just furthermore, uh, I think that there was a paper like by Miller and Hart. Um, and they also told us that these unrolled re recurrent feed forward networks, they are, they are stable dynamical systems, which is important when you, when you work with unrolled, uh, uh, 
kind of recurrent networks. Um, and so that we memorize spatial temporal features correctly. So there is a bunch of literature which tell you that this is the right thing to do. And by this design, the output of the network uh, is, a, is a heat map of, we just chosen the mid frame. So the idea is we would like to infer, you know, position in form of a heat map of the mid, uh, of the mid width frame. And this is basically um, also described in another paper that this is a good idea. <clears throat> so lastly, our localizer currently assumes presence of single persons, right? So we, we are not able at the moment, as it is depicted here, to cope with multiple people. We are kind of restrained at the, at the moment uh, on single people, but, but that might be possible and it's just a, a left for future research. So now we have a network architecture. We have a, a data as input, data as output. The question comes, how, how is the training performing? Well, for this unit training, uh, in a way we cast uh, this inference as classification problem. And, and that was actually proposed by Bertinetto. So this is nothing new. And uh, it was, well, it was cast in, in the context of object tracking. Um, but it's nothing kind of special or not, nothing new or so. Well, in, uh, so the idea here with the heat map is that each, each pixel in a way encodes um, either minus one or one. Uh, so one representing the class of lattice locations within the image, right? Um, and for, for simplicity and to account for some kind of uncertainty in the position, uh, we are not uh, kind of defining the heat map as a, uh, a single spike, but you know, as a, you know, a circle with a, some kind of radius. So that's also important. So each, each pixel value in the inferred heat map is in a way unbounded and real valued. And uh, and this can be seen on the right. So on the on the top, you see the kind of a ground truth, you know, with, which is really kind of a sharp edge. But on the bottom, you see this real valid heat map. And that has a reason because the our loss function, which we use for training, uh, is logistic loss. So we, in a way, define a pixel-wise logistic loss between the ground truth heat map and the inferred heat map. Uh, and which you can see here uh, by this formula. So this is basically the, the loss function where both heat maps, ground truth and inferred heat map are the parameters. And that is kind of resolved uh, pixel wise by the logistic loss that you can see here. Okay, so, so the training is stopped early. So to prevent overfitting, um, when the current epoch is half a percent larger than the smallest loss on the validation data of all epochs we have seen so far or have learned so far, right? Um, this is also what we, what we use. Okay, so now finally, I would like to explain a bit more about the data for, for the supervised learning. Well, uh, as training data, we have decided to use the KTH data set, which is quite old. Uh, and it's about, I think, 600 videos or so of, of, of single per persons uh, walking, running, indoor and outdoor. And the, the purpose of this data set at that time was action recognition. But we have chosen it because of its simplicity. And also a quite uniform background and, and, and the person uh, very much in the right size, I would say. And we, we manually annotated this data. So there was no manual, uh, there was no annotation available. So we did that uh, uh, and we annotated this data by, by uh, generating also then ground truth heat maps, as I explained before. As, te as test data, uh, we have created a new data set, uh, which we call 
the natural fragmented occlusion NFO data set. And that consists of four videos of a single person. And I think you have also seen before, just before this one image I, I shown just at the beginning of this work um, of, of a single person walking behind uh, bush trees, you know, in different scenarios. So you, here you see three. So we have four videos, four scenarios. It's a much a smaller data set, of course. Uh, we also annotated that data set uh, and was quite tricky actually to annotate this data set, but it was still possible for us. So, um, uh, so the fragmented occlusion was not that challenging, you know, for us as humans, but still it was challenging, um, and, and but it was possible. Uh, so, um, so this both of this training and this test data, they were kind of resized by bilinear interpolation and then padded. Uh, to meet the size of the unit, right? This needs to be done. And then we um, <clears throat> we we also sufficiently capture uh, so 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 that that was basically the data engineering part, right? So what what I would like now to explain is uh, that and that's now very important uh, for the for the training is that um, that the problem uh, with this uh, fragmented occlusion is that you will never be able in the training data to um, capture annotated data under fragmented occlusion. And we were thinking quite a lot about this problem. And occlusion is also a big problem because it's not forming a group. It's not like rotation or translation where you could do augment augmentation and things like this, right? This is not possible with occlusion. So, so, so in this work, we choose, we choose a different approach. And uh, I will now show you also preliminary results on that. Um, that we were able actually to train fully on unoccluded data on this KTH data set. And then we were testing on, on this actually new test sequences. Um, showing fragmented occlusion. And it was still be possible actually to use this detector, although there was no fragmented occlusion in the training data set. That's a quite surprising result, but I'm trying to explain you a little bit more in detail uh, in the next slides why this, why we believe, or at least uh, we thought that this is possible. Um, yeah, so I think this is also in, in a way in line with this uh, palmer kerman ship theory. Now, now I would like to show you some results. So this is a this is a video, one of these uh, four videos um, of a person walking uh, left, right. Uh, what you can see here, this is a color coded video. So. Um, you see here, red is, 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 is a high likelihood that there is the location of the person, uh, whereas blue is, is, is a very low likelihood. Right? Uh, uh, in this video, you will not see uh, empty frames. So we omitted that because our localization method is at the moment not able to cope with that. So it has no concept of an empty scene. And uh, I start now. So although, although the network has never seen in the training data fragmented occlusion, it's, it's quite nicely recognizing the location or kind of estimating or regressing this location. There are from time to time false positives. Uh, as you can see, there are also other motions in the video. So there is not only the motion uh, coming from the person, there is also the this bush is, for example, weaving in the wind and things like this, which has an influence, of course, on the result. Now, when it comes to quantitative analysis, um, so first of all, I would like to explain a little bit our empirical evaluation. So um, we use manually labeled center of gravity of the person's appearance as positives, right? Um, that's important, and and we measure true positive and false positives by thresholding. 
the Euclidean distance actually between this, this ground truth position and uh, the maximum actually of, of uh, the maximum the maximum pixel value in the inferred heat map. So basically you get a heat map, you take the maximum, the max, and then you compute the Euclidean distance to the ground truth position. Um, And then we, we use that actually then to measure precision. And, uh, and as we, we do not have a concept of absence because we were not at, the, at that time, we were not, we were focusing on localization. We're not, we're not focusing on detection. Uh, we neglected, neglected true, true negative and false negatives, right? Okay, so so here uh, they are not. We did two experiments. This is the first one. Um, so this first result, in a way, tries to confirm the importance of motion, right? Um, so what you can see here, there is a table. So there is n. There is the number of video frames, which you see here. These are the rows. So there are. What happens when you feed in a single image, three images, five, seven, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and then you have columns. This gives a temporal resolution. So basically, that would be the original uh, uh, temporal resolution, so the full frame rate, and then when you take every second, every third, fourth, fifth image, and so on. So when you reduce temporal resolution. And uh, what you see in each row, uh, so there is a top, the top number is basically um, the precision. And uh, the bottom number are, uh, is the true positives, you know, in this, over these, all these four videos, right? And what you can immediately see is that when you use just a single image, uh, that the network is not able, at, it's not, not, not able at all actually to um, uh, kind of localize the person correctly, right? So the precision numbers are very low, the true positives are very low. But as soon as you feed the network with more than a single image, and when it's able to kind of uh, also learn spatial temporal features, those numbers arise very, very quickly. So with three, we, we, we really increase from let's say 0 0.06 to 0 0.68. And then, and then with five, even larger, I think the maximum was about 0 0.96, which is a quite high number actually, that was uh, achieved for when, when, we, when we use seven images in a row. So seven consecutive images. And, and I think that's a, that's a nice result, which just tells you, okay, uh, really this, this motion perception, which only appears when you use more than one image is in a way, you know, important for localization under fragmented occlusion. There is nothing else which these numbers tell you. But I think for us, that was, of course, a very kind of, you know, interesting result. And uh, it's also interesting to see that, that, that uh, an optimal temporal resolution exists in a certain sense, you know. Uh, we did not el elaborate more on that in this master thesis, but I think that that's, that's, quite, that's quite a first nice result. Uh, I think there was a second result, yeah, here it is, uh, which is even more important, I think, uh, which uh, is not fully understood yet, but uh, it, it was a first result. So basically, there was this question, why can we uh, use this learn, uh, this trained network, which was trained on fully unoccluded data, why can we use it on fragmented, fragmentally occluded data, right? Even the scenario was different. I mean, the, we, we have chosen the KTH data set uh, to fit in a way our test videos, but still the domain is a bit different. The, the, the scenes are different. 
So what you see here are there are actually four images uh, with, uh, under this table. Uh, so the idea was to manually eliminate spatial data. And we did that. Um, so the, the idea was when we can, in a way, eliminate spatial information, we can force the network to learn more spatial temporal features. And the reason how we came to this idea was basically that when we were feeding, and we did that also with synthetic experiments, uh, when we were feeding networks with uh, images of full resolution, then all, all, there's always spatial features which are uh, can discriminate a specific task. And, and, and we, in a way, learn perfectly, you know, um, to cope with synthetically uh, generated occlusion. But then when we use the, the trained method actually on, on the new test data, it always failed. So it was not able to, in a way, generalize, right? So, so that, that the first idea was, well, this network is not really exploiting spatial temporal features or the, in, in spatial temporal space, the, 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 the temporal information you know, of people walking around, for example, temporal coherence, things like this. So the idea was basically to, to reduce uh, the spatial information in this, in this way, for example, by reducing uh, this radiometric uh, resolution. So uh, what you see here is uh, here we use simply uh, less color. So I think that's, that's, that's four, a four bit here, four bit image a three and a two bit image. So we end up with four colors, whereas this is the original grayscale image with uh, 256 intensity values. Um, so um, that was our idea actually to reduce uh, the, re uh, the resolution in the radiometric space. And this is what you see here in the table as rows, as little n. So these are two bit, three bit, four bit images. And in the columns, you see the um, temporal resolution again, right? And now what's interesting is that uh, when you train on KTH data set with two-bit images, and then you really get a very high precision on the test data, which was the NFO data set, right? And also, of course, this large true positive rate. Uh, whereas when you go back actually to the original grayscale images, three, four bit, then this precision really drops, right? So it, the network, when you have, when you present more spatial information to the network during training, it, 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 it cannot cope with fragmented occlusion than on the test time. Um, there is not more at the moment, you know, um, about this phenomenon, this is uh, what we. Uh, this is just. Uh, these are these this little experiment and these numbers. Uh, there is no further investigation at the moment, but um, I think I think that's a, that's an interesting uh, interesting result because uh, because uh, learning learning fragmented occlusion, uh, uh, training networks for coping with fragmented occlusion, for example, this localized localization network, using synthetic data is always pro problematic when it comes then to new test sequences, new scenes, and so on. And as, as I explained before, as, as I said, occlusion is not a group. Uh, data augmentation is a problem with occlusion. And uh, and it seems that 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 we we we, tr we in a way force the network by reducing uh, the colors we 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 force the network to focus on let's say uh, very simple spatial information like 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 those contour contour information things like this and then also the um, the temporal changes of those spatial features, right, over time, because we're using spatial temporal features in our network. And that might generalize to new, to new even occluded data. Okay, so that's, that's now um, this work. Uh, this is this part.
Um, now I have a last part in my in my talk, uh, which is actually recent work I'm I'm kind of doing uh, together with uh, Marie Marianne Loza, which is a master student. Uh, we just started actually with this work. Um, uh, that's quite new. So there is not so much, there are not so much results at the moment, but I think it's interesting for you also to see that. And I'm also happy uh, in the discussion maybe to get your views or comments or some ideas. So um, again, uh, it's about fragmented occlusion and idea actually is here. Um, there, that's a kind of a new scenario. So this is a, a kind of a fence scenario. So you have a fence and, and there is an object behind, an object of interest behind the fence, which we would like to recognize. So you could imagine that the standard object detectors, they all fail, not possible to recognize them. Even I'm not sure if you can recognize and can tell me now what object it is. I mean, we humans are really good and we have a lot of prior information. Of course, when I show you the video, it becomes, I think, clearer for you what the object of interest is. Um, so why, why I call this video deocclusion, uh, this work, um, and I think this should become clear now in this next slide. So, so before I showed you the idea of developing something like a recognition algorithm, which is coping with fragmented occlusion. Here we are following the idea that we would like in a first step actually to develop a video processing algorithm. This is this F, you know, a video processing algorithm, which is able to deoclose a single uh, a moving object actually from a particular video frame. Or let's say we have a, a sequence of images and for a particular uh, image, we would like to do a deoclosure based on the sequence of images. This is done by this little app. That, that's the reason why I say this is a video processing algorithm. So basically you, you, you deal call a specific image and then you could use a standard object detector on top of this deocluded image to do a recognition. So that's, that's a, a bit of different approach. And it poses also a lot of assumptions. Um, um, but okay, so I, what we did uh, in the last month was that we, we did just tried a, a first experiment, which I can show you here. So in this result, which we, we generated really um, a simplified version of F, I would say, we assumed that we have a global translation, which you have seen in the video before. There is just, you know, uh, this constantly moving object actually moving. Um, and, uh, and, and the object is also assumed to move front or parallel. So there is no projective um, uh, uh, model behind. Uh, in, in the there is no uh, projection, actually full projection involved, right? Which, which makes things more tricky. We also assume that there is no deformable object involved. And, and we, so this is all kind of, you know, assumed that it's everything is static, uh, front or parallel, you know, global translation constantly moving as you have seen in this picture and before. So what we did is actually then we did, we, we, we took these 30 video frames, not more, and, and we manually lined them, you know, with our prior segmentation or something like this. So we really were looking for, you know, little correspondences, which was very tricky for us, but we in a way succeeded. And then we also assumed, you know, as this is constantly moving, you know, these pixel shifts uh, in, in a couple of consecutive images uh, to be the same as in the, in, the, in the neighborhood. So we did not uh, estimate those correspondences for each consecutive image, right? But just for a few, and then um, we put all this price on top of it. And then what we did, so we, we, we aligned those, those those images and then we did some integration so we through this alignment process and this is well known so uh, you know the idea to align multiple images and then to integrate uh, over multiple observations in cases of occlusion 
This is known uh, for, for many years in synthetic approach imaging. And there are, there are a couple of really interesting papers and things like this. So this is nothing new, but we did simple averaging and just we tried it out, you know, with um, this is kind of new is that using a static camera and a moving object because in synthetic approach imaging, you always have a light field. So you have multiple cameras and you are all observing a static scene. So we have not a static scene here. We have a dynamic scene. And in this case, the camera is not moving, but this is not constrained. So the camera can move, the uh, scene can move, at least the object of interest. Uh, and this is where we are targeting. Um, and this is our aim. So this this we are targeting. Uh, um. And uh, when we when we apply this manually defined F uh, to this sequence, what I've shown you before, we get this kind of result. So what you and I think this is quite nice now is that that you see. I think you can recognize now this object of interest. I think it's a. Of course, it's a moving a blue little car, and we, we didn't do that at the moment. But I, I would believe that a, a standard object detector, when it's trained pro properly, can can be applied on onto this decoded image. Um, there is a second. There was a, we did a second experiment um, with a, a, a second uh, video sequence. So also here. A static camera, a moving object, um, and and there we took 924 frames. And what you see here is uh, on the left top you see the first frame, and then and then we did averaging over a certain number of frames. For example, here we took the first five frames, uh, bottom left, we took the first hundred frames, and then right, we took all the frames, which were all aligned. And that's kind of the best result you can get with this manual manual algorithm. And and that's quite amazing when you when you just see you know the difference between let's say this picture and this picture. Um, so here you can really recognize that there is a white car. You can even recognize a road. You can recognize the house. So there is a, it seems to be a, also um, um, there is a kind of a, a fence and, and and so on and so forth. So a lot of scene details become visible. Uh, we did not do any kind of more uh, deeper experimentation now. You know how how good this occlusion works in terms of occlusion size, you know, like I think there is a relationship, of course, between uh, those little gaps between the lamellas and the lamella size and so on, and also on the temporal resolution of the video and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we just, uh, that was just a first um, a look into, into the possibility of video occlusion in terms of can we use that with moving objects, right? Okay, and then we were thinking uh, quite a lot about, you know, uh, okay, that was a manually defined video deocclusion algorithm. How could this be done automatically? So just to come up with an algorithmic proposal for this uh, function f, and and this is at the moment the status. So what you see on the right hand side, basically, is um, is our algorithm. So what, uh, so the input is the sequence of images. And now, uh, what we believe what should be the first step is basically uh, this is the screen box, and motion is essential for this first step. Uh, therefore, these two two arrows actually to this green box. So the first this first task is actually to reduce information in these individual video frames by segmenting. You know, so it's a segmentation process. Each frame into a crucial object and background. So this is what we believe. What 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 dynamic occlusion task are also doing in the in the human brain is that in a way we are able to. To segment out, you know, what what is occlusion, what is the object of interest, what is the background, right? And then, of course, that's not the end. So um, 
uh, given this, uh, uh, we, we need to identify, and this is this orange box, in a way to identify these visible parts of the object. Uh, this is also very much what I've shown you before with the theory of, of spatial temporal relatability, right? So in a way we need a representation of those uh, visible parts of the object. And when we have that, we are in a way able to define a, a common coordinate frame and then also to align you know, those visible parts um, to, to, uh, to align those frames, right? To, 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 to get in correspondence. This is basically what, what, is, what is mentioned on the positional updating, right? Um, and when we have done this, then the last step is, is to, then we have multiple observations for each pixel. And then the question comes, you know, how can we pick out those pixels which come from the object of interest and not from the occluder? So this integration process, this is this last step, which then gives us, uh, so this is the re this red one here, this integration, and that gives us for a particular uh, video frame a de-occluded image. Now, what was interesting in the last weeks, I was in contact with uh, also uh, people from psychology, and they told me that uh, they think that this is very important also to have feedback to uh, from higher levels to lower levels, right? And we were also thinking about that we would like to apply object detector on the de image, and that could be this high level feedback that we also as humans try to recognize what we see behind, let's say the, the trees or a fence, uh, and which also drives and can control all these low level uh, tasks which I have uh, defined here. But that's all. Uh, unexplored and and, and just uh, uh, future work at the moment. Now, what we did also uh, is uh, like for this very first step uh, where we are at the moment focusing on, we we want to understand you know how well optical flow methods are actually performing and if they are in a way useful. So optical flow. Basically, it's most general uh, method for, for estimating apparent motion. So basically, this is done individually for each pixel. So the outcome is basically a vector field. And, um, and there, is a, there are a couple of new approaches uh, using neural networks. There's one which is called Raft, which is a, a quite in interesting approach. And this is the outcome, what you can see here for this fan sequence, right? So, I was surprised actually, to be honest, I was quite surprised about this result because these, um, these gaps where, where, where motion is visible are quite small. And, and yeah, and it's not 100% perfect, uh, but still I think uh, Raft does quite a, quite a good a job actually in, in, in recognizing the motion field in this case. Although it, this was not part of the training data there because all these modern optical flow methods are all trained on synthetic data. Um, but when we, when we go for more like more sophisticated scenarios like this, uh, this scenario here from our NFO data set uh, with the person behind the tree, uh, then we clearly see that even uh, the newest methods are kind of breaking down with this uh, fragmented occlusion. So here you still see parts of the head. So this is estimated correctly, but then you know you get this this kind of noisy, noisy motion feel uh, because because this raft is not able to cope with this fragmented occlusion. So it seems also that fragmented occlusion is not really um, a topic at the moment in optical flow. Uh, research, uh, which indeed is. So uh, in a way that was in the 90s a topic, but then people uh, went more for, let's say, very complex motions, motion fields, and, and, and did, not, did not focus on multiple motions coming from fragmented occlusion, because in fragmented occlusion, it doesn't matter how large your region of analysis is. If you make it very large, you still have multiple motions. When you make it very small, you still have multiple motions. 
and optical flow methods are assuming very small patches, uh, small windows, small regions of analysis, uh, which is fine even with complex motions, but still a challenge, of course, at motion boundaries. But for the fragmented occlusion case, that's that's not a solution. So that's the reason also why the all is breaking down here. And we are trying to improve that, but this is still ongoing work. I cannot tell you at the moment where how far we can go, but maybe next time I can tell you something. So this brings me to the conclusion. So fragmented occlusion occurs in natural environments, which is a niche area, I would say at the moment, but but okay, that, that it is. There are applications like in border surveillance, there might be future applications uh, in other fields like search and rescue and so on and so forth. Motion analysis is perhaps essential for robust object recognition. Um, I think I think this I have shown in, in kind of many in all these cases, you know, that when you want to have really robust object recognition under under let's say occlusion in this case, you, you in a way need to consider motion. So the single image is not enough. Uh, a fragmented occlusion causes the problem of multiple motions. That's important uh, to understand. And the multiple motion problem is a severe problem in, in motion analysis. Uh, but, but in a way, I kind of, we are trying to rediscover that. And, and I hope I have shown you uh, some good examples. And that's the reason also why modern optical flow methods break down in these cases. Although they are really, really working very well on many, many benchmarks with very complicated uh, motions in, in very complicated motion scenarios, right? With many motions and and so and 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 and, and, and very um, motions which which go far far beyond you know simple translational motions and things like this they are really uh, uh, kind of uh, struggling with fragmented uh, multiple motions caused by fragmented occlusion and fragmented occlusion deserves i think more research in computer vision um and perhaps also inspired by the results in human vision research and i'm on this on this on this way and 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 um and trying to um find solutions and that brings me actually to the end of my presentation um, thanks for listening if you're interested in the work we are doing uh, here is my email and also my uh, web page uh, linkedin account so um, i'm really looking forward uh, talking with you and please contact me if you're interested uh, on the topic